Burning Shoulders Online and our uh, state website, shoulders.ca. And there's a, there's a lot of player resource page there. And you can even send us a question you know, online too if you want to check questions. Or you can file a running the real impacts, you can file a consumer complaint. Um, and we will then uh, work, investigate that case, work with your insurance and try to resolve it. You can't resolve all the issues, but not every issue is not the same. But uh, it's, for example, last year's lawyers received about 400 complaints. And we were able to recover about $70 million for consumers. So, um, not just on the employers. And so, please come to us with any impacts you have and we'll, we'll seek a solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. So, um, uh, in part because the, um, the, the scale of the devastation of the campfire is sort of beyond it. Experiences, and we're all kind of trying to do our best here to uh, get information out. And we know um, how many of you are uh, are, are temporarily living in Chico, or show of hands. Okay. Um, how many of you are living in Oregon? Okay. Regalia? Okay. So what we're going to try to do, I know it's in our room. What we are going to try to do, I think it feels like we're going to will be um, doing our regular uh, monthly road trip recovery workshops uh, following up on this in Chico. I think my sense is that will be easy for folks. Um, but tonight we're um, we're streaming this on Facebook Live um, from our website, which is uphealth.org. And, and our goal is to um, make it easy for people to be able to access our information and support wherever they may be with it. So, um, and if you see you see those signs around the room, and they're not uh, they're not going to be insurance companies here tonight. Um, that is something that sometimes the Department of Insurance will facilitate. Um, but that is uh, for at the end. What we invite all of you to do is to go to the sign um, that is your insurance company, and then um, exchange phone numbers or email addresses with other people. Who are insured by that same company, and that way uh, you'll be able to stay in touch and maybe share ideas and support each other um, because your policies will look similar to theirs, and you may have the same adjuster that they may have, and so they you may be able to help each other. That's part of what United Policyholders does is bring people together, give you information, and try to make it easy for you to get the answers. To the questions that you may have on your road to recovery. So, um, without further ado, let's see. Um, what are we? You've already heard a little bit. Um, we're really not like anything we've ever encountered, um, except I mean, we are a 501c3, like Red Cross, or the United Way, we're not for profit. Um, uh, let's go there. Let's go back. Oh, we're going the wrong way here. <laughs> Sorry. Human, human difficulties here. <laughs> Sorry. Let's do this. Oh, where's the I don't know. This is very confusing. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm so sorry. Um, maybe I'll just jump ahead. Um, there we go. Okay, here we are. Uh, we're a not for profit charity, um, which means that we survive on grants, like you've heard from all kind of representatives, donations. Um, and uh, at a sponsorship program, but we don't sell insurance. We're not. You can't hire us to be your lawyer. You can't hire us to be your public adjuster. Um, we really are here just to give you uh, the guidance that we have distilled over our 27 years of going into areas after there have been disasters, particularly wildfires, um, and then explaining insurance for those people. Helping people get in the right state of mind if there is such a thing in their situation, but the, the, the healthiest possible state of mind um, in order to navigate 
your insurance claim and get the money, um, make the decisions that you need uh, to be able to move forward uh, and get a roof back over your head. So um, my name is Amy Fox, and I am um, a lawyer. Um, I co-founded the organization with a woman who had um, decades of experience as a claim adjuster, very much like Sandy Watts, who's here tonight. Um, and uh, I co-wrote the yellow book that you picked up uh, on your way in, uh, and, and a good number of publications on our website. Um, our website, uphealth.org, has um, more information than you ever need or want, um, but then because we've been encountering these issues uh, for so long, we're encountering the free removal and content, dwelling, um, and, and SBA loans and uh, individual assistance grants and uh, one gesture saying one thing and another gesture saying another thing. Pretty much most of your questions could get answered on the website. Over the years, that people really, of course, um, want to be able to hear from a human being um, the information that they need and they want to be able to ask questions. So, we are going to get through the educational program as quickly as we can and give you the opportunity to ask questions. Um, okay, let's, let's pray here. There we go. Just, okay. Anyway, I'm going to introduce. Uh, Sandy Watts, um, who is with the United Households. Uh, Sandy has 25 years of experience in claims and claims management, troubleshooting, and dispute resolution. Uh, she's very much, as I said, like the woman who co-founded the organization with me uh, a long time ago. Uh, she is our project coordinator of the Roadmaster Recovery Program that, that brought to your community tonight. And are hoping to continue bringing um, with the help from the rural county representatives and others um, for the full year at least. Um, she's also managing our Ask an Expert forum where people can ask questions um, and doing her best to keep up with the very, very heavy flow. So if you have already emailed us a question and you didn't get an answer yet, please bear with us. Um, we will get to your question and do our best. Um, so the little yellow book that you should have picked up if you didn't. Um, we have uh, more copies outside, or uh, we will definitely be bringing them to our next workshop in January. Um, that was written by I didn't do that. Um, that was written by a um, okay, it just names on its own. Um, by a number of people, myself, um, and then a number of people who once walked in the shoes you're now walking in. Um, you know, one day everything was fine, and then the next day um, their lives were completely different, and they were the new one. Um, so there's a lot of kind of homegrown wisdom in there, as well as um, technical information, and very um, useful little uh, uh, inventory list at the back. For those of you who are not internet savvy, there's a, a nice long list that will help you um, with your personal property inventory. That's a screenshot of our website. Um, we have a dedicated library for your community. Um, the, okay. And maybe the computer is, is, is deciding that if I talk too long, it's just going to move to the next slide. Um, so the fine print, tonight's presentation is general guidance only, not legal advice. We do not endorse or warrant the quality or services of any volunteer speakers um, or any of the sponsors listed on our website. Um, and so we're going to start with the first steps. Um, state of mind. Um, okay, so um, each person's recovery, of course, is different um, in a lot of ways, but in some ways it's similar. Um, so what is insurance? Insurance is a vehicle to get you back where you were before you lost. But it won't dry itself. As or as. So Flow's not popping up uh, in your living room. There's no magic wand that's going to make everything go back. Um, you probably know that. Um, but it, it just is telling you that insurance is a business and a claim is a work. Um, and if you speak up, then you have a very good job at being treated fairly and paid in full by your insurance company and having a good experience. Um, knowledge equals power. 
And the more you understand your insurance policy, your legal rights, and the value of your losses, the more insurance benefits you will recover. And and the smoother your claim will go. And we need to stay on this for a minute. The computer does the rush along. Okay? The reason we talk about the state of mind and I mentioned flow is that most of us have gone through our whole lives thinking that insurance is this sort of feel good, we're going to take care of you, and everything's going to be okay. And there's a certain amount of truth to it, but really, that is just an act. What I'm here to tell you is that one of the most important things you, you're, you're going to need to do in the next uh, weeks and months is tell you the value of your losses, how much you lost, and how much it's going to take to put you back where you were. Um, and, and California has incredible um, consumer protections. This is, if you're going to lose your home, this is a very good state to lose it in because um, we have a very strong department of insurance that keeps um, a watch on the insurance companies. And as powerful as they may be, um, they have to abide by the rules in our state. And we have a lot of rules in our state. And you're going to hear a little bit tonight about some of the rules that some of the out-of-state adjusters that come in don't know about. And so part of what we're here to tell you is that not only is this picture of insurance as this, you know, friendly, smiley, and that's just advertising, um, not that they're bad or mean, it's just that it's, it's a business situation, right? Um, and so you guys, how many, how many of you have gone to more than four meetings so far hosted by somebody that's trying to get you to hire them? Okay. How many of you gone to one meeting from hosted by a public adjusting company? Okay. How about a lawyer? This one's meeting is hosted by. Okay. All right. So you know, why don't we? We've only been in town here, you know, today. We've been at the local system center. How many of you have been at our table at the local system center? Great. Okay. So you know, we've had as much coverage there as we could. Um, most of our volunteers are people who, um, again. Yeah, walk in your shoes and are now here to share with you and all that. Um, but, but again, there's a lot of people out there that want to tell you, oh, you can't do your insurance thing on your own. you got to hire me and I'll take care of it. Well, for some of you, that may be true. But our organization is here to make sure that um, you get everything that you're entitled to, no matter what path you decide to take, okay? Because you already paid for coverage and claim service when you bought your insurance. You already paid to get treated fairly. You already paid to have your insurance help you tax costs. You already paid for that service. If you have to pay for it in a second because you don't feel like you're getting it from them the way you want it, that's fine. But just understand that the law is here and the regulations are here to protect you um, from a system that isn't as, um, it's not as up and down as you think. And what I mean is, insurance adjusters are human beings. Some of them are, are, are smarter than others. Some of them are more ethical than others. Some of them are more diligent than others. So a lot of people's experience is really going to depend on the personality and the training level of the adjuster that's assigned to the employee. And that's one of the reasons why we have you guys group, if you can, and share information. Because if you get a suspension, how many of you already are already on second? Okay, okay. Um, a lot of people find that they get rotated through, that they get one adjuster and then that one leaves and then another. And that's normal because what typically insurance companies will send out pack adjusters, and these are kind of road warriors that will go from, from town, you know, disaster area to disaster area, and then they gotta go home, right? So, so it's not necessarily evil that your insurance company may rotate personnel through. The tricky part is that you want continuity, right? You want your claim to get um, to get settled as quickly and as painless as possible. So why do we give you these journals? Now, anyone, you know, you can probably guess why we give a journal to you. It's because we want to help you keep your insurance claim in as straight as possible line. Given there are some things you can't control. You don't know who's going to get signed. You don't know if they're going to be up to speed on the rules in California. 
the rights that you have to 36 months of uh, temporary grant. That's a law that no other city has. The fact that you have the right to replace your house by buying a new one instead of rebuilding and still get your max benefits. Again, we're the only state that really gives you that right to do. So there's a lot of judges that come in and they don't know about those rules. So we're going to be here to tell you that, that, that they know their rights. And even if you don't, I'm not starting to argue with everything your justice says um, at all. In fact, you know, the better you can keep your relations with your adjuster, the better things will be. Um, but I'm just telling you that just because your adjuster says something doesn't mean um, that they necessarily are, are 100% right. Okay, um, we've already talked about this, but your insurance claim is more like a business transaction um, and it is your assets. You have the most the biggest faith in restoring them. The insurance company obviously is in business. They have shareholders to keep happy. They have the profits to maintain. Um, but, but our advice is to give your insurance company a chance to do the right thing, but just don't be a pushover. That's kind of a, a core piece of our advice. Okay? Don't come in loaded for bear and think, oh, you know, I talked to somebody who told me they have a point. That may not happen to you, but I hope it doesn't. You know, a lot of people just do fine um, with their insurance, but again, having your eyes open is a great way to increase your chances that you'll be one of those people who does fine. Um, okay, so coming to this meeting is a great first step. Um, hopefully, none of you have ever lost a home before, um, although it's possible some of you have. Um, but for anyone who's, um, who, who is sort of typical, the only claim you've ever probably filed has been maybe for an auto claim or theft. And when, when you're in a, a claim situation with a, okay, this is crazy. Okay, hold on. You know, I'm um, When there are large dollars at stake, disputes often arise. Okay. Um, some claims go smoothly from the end to end, we hope there is steps. What are some of the common disputes? How much and when are benefits owed? My coverage is inadequate, typically for the 12, two thirds of the disaster survivors we work with find out that they don't have enough coverage on their dwelling to cover rebuilding it the way it was. Who's to blame? Another common dispute is the value of their losses. You know, your builder says, oh, it'll cost $400,000 to put this house back. And the insurance company generates a, a computer, uh, an exact estimate that looks super fancy, and it says three hundred. So the real computer is 300 Very common dispute, not that hard to fix, very common. Um, another one, which I already mentioned, is your adjuster know the rules of California. And he or she follows them. That's been a big deal. Is in the 2017 fire areas, and, and people got very up in arms about adjusters coming in and not knowing the rules. And the California Department of Insurance was very strong in coming out and, and going, uh, going to the insurers and saying, We're not going to put up with this. You, your adjusters have to follow the rules. And that is part of um, their complaint process that you will be able to use if you know. Okay, try not to rush any aspect of the recovery. And we know this is hard advice to follow uh, because you want to get home as quickly as you can. Um, but losing a home is an incredibly disorienting experience. Is our tech guy still here? I know what's happening. It's not the, it's not the auto forward thing. I think the other speaker is. Um, losing a home is an incredibly disorienting experience. It takes months for most people to completely regain their normal memory and critical thinking function. How many of you are having trouble sleeping? Showing us. Right. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, in addition to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so again, this isn't the best time to be making these big critical decisions, right? So, um, and yet, you get a hard sell from a lot of people, right? You get hard sell.
from uh, public adjusters, maybe lawyers, maybe builders, uh, maybe uh, real estate speculators who are interested in buying a lot, all that kind of thing. So you're probably getting it from a lot of sides, a lot of pressure. And your adjuster may be saying to you, oh yeah, you've got to get this, this inventory done in 60 days. Well, that's probably not true. Uh, the extensions for things like that are very easy to get. And you can always put an inventory in that says undetermined. You have at least two years or more to get your uh, full place of value on your content. So you have plenty of time. In fact, time is on your side. That I can promise you. Now, what is the first thing that you need to do is to get a complete and current copy of your home insurance policy. You're going to need the declarations page. How many of you have already gotten your policy? Okay. Um, and at first, it may sound okay. So when you get your policy, look at that declarations page. I've got the endorsements that are add-ons, riders, add-ons, just fancy words for add-ons or um, take away language. Um, if you haven't gotten a copy, a uh, complete current copy of the policy, you want to make sure your request is in writing. The law says they have to get it to you within 30 days, but I really don't think it should take them that long. Um, we have a sample letter on our website to help you um, if you need help on that. Insurance will go at first. It may sound as though your insurance adjuster is speaking a foreign language. Coverage A, ACP, scope of loss. And most policies are going to be divided into sections. And you're going to be, going to be fine once you grasp all this. You should hear these people have this number of their experts in they, you know, all the little Israel and all these little uh, actors. You don't need to become an expert in any of it. You just need to understand the basic buckets of your coverage and what the rules are. Um, typically, they're going to be dwelling, contents, loss of use, sometimes referred to as daily. Other structures, debris removal, trees and shrubs, code upgrades. Those are pretty much the big ones. And I'm going to turn uh, the mic over now to Sandy uh, to talk a little bit about how you dissect what you've got in your policy. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Sandy Watts. Um, so, let me, one of the things that's really important. And I just had this illustrated to me when I went to a mediation with somebody from Sonoma. We got into the room, and the policy that their insurance company sent them was not the policy that was in force on the date of loss. So really important, when you look at the declaration page here, you should have a little pointer. Um, you need to match up all the numbers. If you guys can see, like, see all the little numbers in parentheses, this. Six zero one zero one thousand twelve. So there's dates and numbers on your policy, and they're on your declaration page. So when you get your declaration page, look for the number. Sometimes it says like HO something or it says FE. You know, there's different numbers. But go back and then look on the bottom of the stack of papers they give you, and make sure that those numbers and the dates match the declarations page, so that you know you're working on. Uh, the copy that was in force on the day of loss, because as we found out in this, in this mediation where they're trying to come to an agreement on the house, that one policy said one thing and the other policy said the other thing, and it was, they were vastly different, and the company had sent her two policies, um, and they were two incorrect policies, so it's kind of up to you to look at that and find out. Now, this might look different for everybody. This is just an example, but here's the blue bay arterial dwelling coverage. The other structures is very common to have 10% of your coverage A dwelling coverage B in other structures. Some of you who had barns and outbuildings and other structures might have a lot more than that. Um, coverage C is personal property, and these numbers don't always numbers don't always match up either. Some companies are kind of it's the same idea. And then the loss of use. Um, loss of use is something, um, sometimes you'll have a number there, sometimes you won't have a number there. Um, some companies, I know State Farm, they don't have a limit on additional living expenses. They have time limits and they use you know, reasonable costs. Okay, so those are 
that you still look at when you look at your declaration. Take oh, this is important. Look at um, replace your house. One of the things that's kind of frustrating to me, um, and I think you're going to understand soon, is that not all of the coverages that you're entitled to collect are listed on the declarations page. This is, this is one of my big pet peeves. So there's a couple things missing here. So we have, like, right here, you have building code upgrade limit. So that's good. That's not always on your declarations page. Sometimes it says 20%. Okay? Sometimes it says, sometimes it doesn't really say anything. Um, and you have to go inside your policy. So things like, and um, Amy was talking about landscaping, tree shrubs and plants, sometimes called debris removal. A lot of those have little extra limits, but you have to go inside the policy and actually read the policy to find what those limits are. So you have to really dig deeply. Yeah, and, and it isn't that. <laughs> It's hard to read the policies. They're written by lawyers. They're terms that you're, you know, newly acquainted with. So keep at it. And once you, once you start reading it, you'll sort of get into get into a habit, and you'll see that they're that they're organized pretty much similarly. They have like definitions, then they have the main coverages, you know, and it says coverage A. We ensure the dwelling, you know, of this of the address on the thing. So you'll see it, and then it'll have other coverages, it'll have exclusions, and you'll get used to it. And the good thing on insurance contracts is that if there's an ambiguous um, coverage, then it's construed, it's in your favor, okay? So if, if something gets in, I've been um, working in Hawaii since the lava hit, and there, um, there was an endorsement for lava that was written by a company, and it was, it was a very strange endorsement. It didn't relate to the policy. And it turns out it was ambiguous. And so all the, even though they had an exclusion for lava, they all got paid because the exclusion was poorly. So kind of interesting. That's, that's where you're in good shape. If that happens. Okay. Um, so this is going to seem abstract right now, but as you move on down um, the adjustment process, you're going to see this more and more. So do your own math. I can't tell you how many times somebody's sent me, um, they sent me these things called statements of loss, and they list out, like, here's how much coverage A, coverage B, and how much we've paid you, and all this, and people send it to me, and you're like, I don't know what's going on, and I look at it, and I'm like, well, the math is wrong. First of all, you know, you need to make sure that if they're telling you, you have, you know, uh, $20,000 for degree removal, and it's 5% of your coverage limit, go back and look at your coverage A limit, Multiply it by 5% and make sure that you have the same figure they have. Okay, so when they pay it out, because I see tons of math errors. Um, so it's really important. And one of the things that people, I, I hear people hesitate to do is they get things from their adjuster, they don't add up, they don't understand them, and they sort of don't know what to do. Go back to your adjuster and say, I can't figure this out. And walk me through it. Because that's what they're paid to do. That's what they need to do. So you need to sort of hold them accountable and say, well, you know, I got a check, and the check doesn't say what it's for, or it lumps things together. You're entitled to a written explanation of what every check is for and under which coverage it's paid and all of that. So if you don't, if it's not clear to you, go back to them and they can re explain it. And do that. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that people ask us a lot about is payments. So have, have a lot of you gotten payments? Okay, so people are historically afraid to cash them, deposit them, send, send them to their uh, mortgage company, and so forth. Don't be afraid to do that. In California, it is not legal to have like, a release on the back of the check to, that says, you know, by signing off this check, you're agreeing that everything is fantastic. Um, so don't worry about that. You can do what you need to do to get the, like if you have to get the money to your mortgage company, um, something like that, go ahead and do it. Follow up with the adjuster if you don't agree or say, I'm researching this and thank you, know, thank you for the check. I'm looking into it and I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, so a lot of times you're gonna find, um, I, I've heard a lot of 
situation, not a lot, but several companies have just made the decision to come in and pay limits. You're fine as long as you check your limits and so forth. If you get a partial check, if you get a check and they say, okay, your house and check for half the amount of your coverage, don't worry about that. They have a duty, um, and hopefully you guys all picked up. If you didn't get it, there's a sheet out there that says, that says insurance um, claims rules. rules for California. It's a really packed information sheet because it tells you how long they have to respond to you and all of this. But they have a duty to give you the undisputed portion of your claim as soon as possible, as soon as it's determined. Within 30 days of determining that they owe you, they have a duty to do that. And most of them, in most cases, really make an effort to say, okay, here's, we know we owe you this amount, take this. And, and it could be woefully low, and you could be entitled to a lot more. But don't, don't get too concerned about it because it's a starting place. It's a place they're just getting it out there and you can just you can keep going. So don't worry, let them know you can keep moving forward. Okay. Um, are these the ones you want to do? Sure. Sorry. We're gonna go back and forth. Alright. Um, so starting to document your loss. Um, obviously some of you are still just being allowed to get back in and um, into the quadrant or what have you. Um, but, but even so, you should be getting your policy, you should be starting a claim diary. Um, we've now given you one to use, we prefer to use the uh, um, It's you're giving you three dividers, so you can split it up by dwelling, contest, and daily, um, or however it is logical to your claim. Um, but we really, really encourage you almost every day if you can, more than once a day, jot down. If you've spoken with somebody about something, jot it down. If you're worried about something that's not determined, you can jot that down. And, and again, you know, you saw how many hands went up when I asked you to have trouble sleeping. So um, there's a lot of reasons to keep a journal. It's not just um, because you, you will be forgetting it, but it's just um, to, to, to have a, a tool for you to see, okay, what was it that I needed to get resolved, that kind of thing. Um, but it's also very important because you are confirming things that your insurance company has said to you, or that a uh, county official said to you, um, or, uh, or a soils person. So again, you're, you're just, um, you know, so that you're not relying on your memory um, uh, right now. You're writing things down, and then you're creating your own paper trail so you can you can reconstruct what's already been resolved and what still needs to be resolved. Um, you hopefully have already met with your adjuster, um, and now uh, there is something that um, the insurance department negotiated a number of years ago with the insurance company. It's called the Voluntary Claims Handling Reform. And what it is is basically a set of rules that most of the major insurance companies said they would abide by. Um, one of them is that they give you an advance of four months on your temporary rent. Um, so four months of, of temporary rent advance. So if you have not gotten that, that's something you can ask for. Another thing is that the voluntary claims reforms uh, say that the insurer should give you an advance of 25% of your contents coverage. 25% of your contest coverage. So again, if you haven't gotten that, that advance, you can ask for it. Um, obviously, you're dealing with debris removal um, and um, making a decision as to whether or not you're going to opt into the coordinated program. Um, the county has been offering a lot of information on the coordinated program. If you have access to the internet, uh, there's a lot of information there on the Butte County Recovers website. Um, when I say start, start scoping your dwelling loss, um, all that, what does that mean? That just means that your insurance is designed to put you back where you were before the loss, to put back the house you had. Almost nobody puts back the same house that they had. Most people either put a bigger house, a smaller house, um, you know, they, they want a different house. 
Um, but the measure of what's called indemnity in insurance, so the amount of money your insurance company owes you is generally what it would theoretically or hypothetically cost if you were to put that house back just the way it was in compliance with the building codes that are in place now. So when we talk about start scoping your dwelling loss, what we're saying is start working on that hypothetical number um, so that that you know what kind of a dwelling settlement you should be negotiating with your insurance company. Now, for most people, after a total loss, it's going to be close or even above your dwelling needs. For most people, after a wildfire and a total loss, your dwelling limits keep the maximum amount. We call it limits when we're talking about insurance. But if all of you need is the maximum amount of money you can get out of that policy from your insurance company or your home is going to be how much it would cost to put that house back. So getting to that number is a great goal for you to have. Now, getting to that number could be for a lot of people because A, most people's plans, if they either were burned up or they never have them to get with because the house is old. Um, and the, the records obviously are also maybe not available unless they are in the cloud. Um, but B, uh, you're not going to, you don't really want to rebuild that house anyway. And when you're talking to builders, you're talking about a price tag on the difference. But really, the fastest way is to get to an agreement with your insurance company to free you up to do whatever you want with that money within, within the rules is to reach an agreement on what it would have cost if you were to put that house in. So, finding somebody to help you do that can be very challenging. But if you can find a builder early on who says, yeah, yeah, I can give you a, a pretty good estimate, that's a great offer to take up on. Okay, that is, that is again, that is kind of ultimately the, the, the smoothest path to reaching an agreement with your insurance company on your dwelling is to reach an agreement. And when we talk about scope, that means the size, the shape, you know, how big was it? What kind of floors did it have? What kind of molding did it have? What kind of exterior finishes did it have? What kind of kitchen countertops did you have? What kind of wood? What, what grade carpet? How much carpet? All those things. And again, that exactly estimate that your insurance company will give you, that is a, that's a version of a scope because it has to be broken down in columns. So if you have a, a builder in town that can help you do some, either look at what the insurance company did and fix it, put in items that they missed, Fix the pricing, that can work, or you can get somebody to do their own thing. We're going to get more into detail about that in our next workshop. But for tonight, I'm just saying that in terms of, of your goal, I mean, that is one of the important focuses. Because again, there's no way you're going to be able to know, at least most people, what you want to do. You're, you know, it's, you're way, way, way too early in the process I mean, for most people to decide am I going to rebuild? Am I going to move? Am I going to what's going to happen? With the town and, and all that, obviously, you have um, a lot of unknowns. So what you do know is that you have a house, and and you know as much as you can, you can gather of details. You can be working on that now. So if you have Google Map images of the house, you have friends that have pictures of your house. You know, any kind of evidence you can you can get your hands on. That's a good activity to be doing now. So try to get whatever evidence you can to start scoping your growing loss. And then with your contents, um, how much detail is your insurance company going to require? And that's kind of um, become sort of a big question. It, it used to be in the old days that everybody had to do a detailed, itemized inventory in order to get their full limits for their contents. Remember we talked about that, Sandy talked about that other bucket for your contents, right? Um, so you have that, that dollar figure, you know, your maximum amount of your contents coverage that you could possibly get is that there would be the number on your wall on your declarations page adjusted for whatever formulas are in your policy. You might have a schedule list, you might have um, some other bumps in the policy. So once you know that you know that that's the target, that's the most you're going to get, 
The question is, how much detail is going to be required for you to get a fair settlement, right? Now, most people are not that underinsured on their contents. If anything, most people have enough contents. But insurance companies today are not requiring everybody to itemize. So it's gotten a little confusing um, and, and a little complicated because some people, some of you here, are going to be required to itemize and it can be excruciating. Um, or maybe you just go about it in a business like way and you get through it and that's how it be. Some of you may get cash out and to your max of your contest, and some of you, most of you, may get an offer from your insurance company to say, okay, we will pay you uh, 30 or 40 or 50 or 80 percent of your contest limits without you having to itemize. But if you want the whole thing, you're going to have to itemize, so it's your choice. So you may have that choice. Lots of people are now being faced with that choice. It's not a decision you have to make today, I can promise you that. It's just something for you to think about, okay? And the United Policy Office gives you two tools to help you value your inventory. One is an Excel spreadsheet, and the other one is a sample of completed home inventory with pricing and everything. So the Excel spreadsheet that was created by one of our volunteers. We took the pricing out, and it's just got every single room that the typical house and every possible position that the person could have. All this, and that's a, a way that you can, you can use that, and you can check the things that you have, and you can put values. So again, we're trying to really give you that tool in case you do need to inventory. You know, on our way up here, we were talking with the survivor on the phone who was worrying. Um, because his insurance company has said, you know, it's okay for you to group things in bulk. Say, like, I had, you know, 100 books instead of listing, you know, four pieces, this and that. Um, you know, and, and he's like, oh, I'm nervous. Is that okay? And he said, yes, that's fine. If your insurance company, they gave him a, a third party vendor to work with now. And he, he said, well, they're telling me that I don't have to list everything like that. Great, that's fine. But he was nervous because he said, I see in my policy it says I'm supposed to. And again, this is my the point I made earlier is that the rules are not quite as black and white as you would think. So the policy may say something, but in reality, the insurer may say it's okay for you to do it differently. So some people can use their AME to buy a trailer, for example. It doesn't say that in the policy, but insurers are more and more giving people that flexibility, and I give credit. To the Department of Insurance, in part for that, because after the, the fires last last year, I think we've already done it again this time. The department put out a notice and said to the insurance companies, "Listen, you know you can pay without requiring any of inventory because you've done. So why don't you just do nothing than that?" Instead, and they made names and they have they published the names of the insurance companies that made it easier on their customers. And that put pressure, and that they did it again this time. So hopefully, you'll be getting these waivers. But if you don't, don't feel like we're saying well, that. That's the way it's always been. We have to have so just use the tools we give you, and know that you'll get them. Okay. Um, we talked about keeping the claim diary um, and why. Um, the paper trail is essential. Documentation is essential. Um, we really encourage you to communicate with your insurance company in writing. Meaning, you, it's not normal for a human being to say, well, this will confirm that you just said to me that I don't need to get itemized my salt and pepper shakers or what have you. Well, you know what? It's important to kind of do that now because that's how you keep things clear and you don't have to reopen something that's already been decided. So just keep on uh, going with that communication uh, in writing. Okay. Uh, okay, we talked about, you know, um, so the last one I'm gonna make, and I'm gonna turn it back um, to Sandy. Um, when interacting with the insurance company, there are two words that describe the best demeanor you can adopt. Polite assertiveness. 
So we're going to go through some of these coverages in a little bit more detail, kind of breaking these down. Um, some of this you guys are going to know, some of it you're going to hear for the first time, but it's crazy. Um, so coverage A is your dwelling, and this is your the main house. Sometimes um, rural properties have more than one house, so sometimes you'll have, um, if you have more than one like, home on the property, you might have building A. Building B, you should be familiar, probably familiar with that. I don't know what happened on this slide there. <laughs> um, okay, so Amy talked about this a little bit. We cannot reiterate this enough. Um, except in the cases where they pay out your policy limits and you don't care about making like a claim to the IRS or any excess loss, or you're not going to join a PD lawsuit or something where you need an estimate, everybody's going to need an estimate of the house that they lost, even if you have no intention of ever going back to it. It's just one of those things you really need. So try to find building plans, any other pictures, you know, um, people end up finding my like, birthday parties. There's things in the background, you know, you have to get really detailed in this um, to, to get information on what and Amy talked about this. Um, what's going to happen in most cases, if you're not just, um, if they're not just paying you your limit for your coverage, they're going to send you, um, it's usually um, a very long itemized um, estimate, it's usually generated by a company called um, Xactimates, the software, most of the companies use that software. It's going to have 80, 100 pages on it, and it's going to list everything in excruciating detail. It's, it's one of those things where it's like garbage in, garbage out. The estimate that they send you to try to settle your claim is only going to be as good as the information you give them, okay? Some of these um, people will go and they'll just try to put in sort of basic things, um, but if you have something different, the only way the adjuster is going to know how to change that estimate is if you tell them. So it's... It's really tedious, it's really long, but you have to go through and they'll have it broken down by a group. So generally what they'll have first is some debris removal, which we can talk about a little bit later. Generally sort of ignore that. And your foundation, really hard to, for you as homeowners to go through things like foundations. But once they get into the rooms, look at the rooms. So if they start, you know, in the entryway, hopefully it's systematic, they start in the entryway. Look at the door that they put on as your front door. Is that door, did you have a big double door? Did they, you know, make sure that the door that they put in there is the door that you have in your house, okay? One of the things is, is that um, Xactimate defaults to eight foot ceilings in every room. It's the default ceiling height. Well, if you have maybe a pitched ceiling or higher ceilings or something like that, make sure that the ceiling height is correct. Make sure that the dimensions of the room are correct, okay, and then um, the number of windows, um, and then the type of the type of things. You know, I tell people it's good to do it a room a day. You know, go through the rooms and take, make a coffee, make a working coffee, get out your red pen, and write on that. Write on, you know, this room has ten foot ceilings. It has hardwood and not carpet. Um, it gets so specific that it goes into baseboards. Um, you know, did you have two inch baseboards or six inch baseboards? How many outlets did you have in the room? How many light switches? And it's, it's super tedious, but every thing that you change and add will make it a lot more correct. So one of the things I tell people is when you get the first estimate, if you're in a situation where they're sending you an estimate to check, don't freak out too much because it's going to be way off. Okay, and so it's up to you to just like say, okay, this is just a rough draft, and we're going to we're going to edit this. Just and, um, and as you edit it, most of the time the money ends up sort of working itself out a little bit better. And but then once you have a scope that you say, okay, this is the house that I lost. Okay, um, then you can go through and say. Well, you might know where you can look at some of the trades and, and compare the prices. And it's pretty easy once you have a match of the insurance company to see where the differences are and then you just focus on them. So it makes it a little easier. But it is tedious. Um, so 
Um, a lot of you will hit this uh, replacement cost, RMC versus ACV. Almost everybody, unless I think the California Fair Plan still does not show cash value policies, but most of the major insurance companies what are called replacement cost policies. And one of the questions we get is, hey, I have a replacement cost policy. Why are they paying me actual cash value if I have a replacement cost policy? And, and that's a very good question. <laughs> but what the policies say is like they're, they have a they call loss settlement provisions, and they say, you have a replacement cost policy, but we're going to pay you up front the actual cash value, which is the depreciated value, okay, until it's repaired or replaced. Okay, so they'll go through and they will depreciate certain items in your building. You need to know that the depreciation is, is something you can always negotiate with. Okay, if you feel that they've depreciated something too much, just go back to them and say, hey, this was in great condition. Even though, you know, this carpet or whatever was 10 years old, we never went in that room, whatever. And you can make a case for that. So they should never depreciate labor. So the only things they can apply depreciation to are things that actually depreciate. Drywall, you know, doesn't really depreciate. Paint does. Okay, carpets do. So, so keep a look out on that. But that's another thing. So you might get a payment that's actual cash value, but you're entitled to that replacement cost of difference once you start either rebuilding or buying a house. Um, if you choose not to rebuild or not to buy and just sort of walk away, you're not entitled to the replacement cost. Okay, in most cases, you're only entitled to the actual cash value. It's sort of, if you think about your car, if you get into a car accident, they're not going to. If you have a you know Pinto or a Pinto, they're not going to buy you a brand new car. They're going to buy you the car that you know, that age you lost. It's kind of the same idea, but you can be add on if you buy something. Um, mobile home, manufactured homes, anybody affected with that? They're very similar. Um, some mobile homes have ACV policies only, so you have to kind of look out and look and see what your policy has. Um, we'll lower limits in a lot of cases, but it's generally the same idea. Um, debris removal, um, and you know, we're not going to get too deep into the consolidated debris removal project. Um, simply because I think there's other people that, that know more about it. But know that in general, and what they do is this. Um, they, if you, most policies have a 5% debris removal, and it's inside your policy, okay? And we'll get into some of these others that are inside. But there's a section of your policy that says, like, additional coverages or supplemental coverages. And underneath that heading, you're going to see all these little add-ons for things that you're entitled to collect. One of them is debris removal, and it'll say 5% of your policy. Well, in most cases, that 5% only kicks in once your coverage A dwelling limit has been exceeded. So one of the things you're going to see is, like, if your insurance company is generating this estimate, you're going to see a bunch of line items at the beginning of them trying to estimate some debris removal. Um, there's some, um, the consolidated debris removal program basically only hits the foundation area of your house, so there's going to be a lot of trees and fences and different things like that that you might have to remove yourself that will come out of it. But this additional 5% comes when you hit your coverage A limit, then that 5% is a little add-on, it's a little bonus. Um, and it was meant to protect people who lost it. So that's that. Um, so most policies have that. Um, there's going to be a lot of cases where there's other debris removal that you need to do um, that's outside of the coordinated debris removal program, and that's, um, that's covered in regular policy. Um, one of the good things that's important. Um, the other thing is the 5% the debris removal on some policies also extends on top of the other coverages. So like your dwelling extension, a lot of policies will give you 5% of your dwelling extension coverage, 5% um, of your contents coverage, that type of thing. So look in your policy and see it. It'll tell you um, that it applies. But that's where taking photos of your area 
and before the debris removal happens is helpful. We've seen a little pushback in Sonoma um, with the carriers saying, well, you know, your whole house burned down. You didn't really incur 5% for your contents. Well, yeah, a lot of that debris was contents. So, um, and we found that with persistence, they are. Okay, extended replacement coverage. Do you guys know what this is? This is one of those coverages that is hidden um, in your policy. Sometimes it's on the declarations page, sometimes it's not. Um, and it's really important. Um, it, it's basically also for people who suffer total losses, but it says basically if you run out of coverage aid limits, we're going to stack another percentage on and increase your dwelling limits, okay? And it's a different percentage just based upon, you know, what, what you bought, what was sold to you. Um, we find a lot of times agents don't explain it very well when they're selling the policy. They just sort of add a little bit on. Um, so you need to look, look on your declarations page. If it's not there, it's usually either in the additional coverages section or sometimes it's in the last settlement um, section. So you kind of have to dig around your policy to find that. Um, and a few policies, like the debris, a few policies will give you this extended coverage on those other sub coverages, on your um, dwelling extension and so forth. So that's, that's good to know. So um, one of the things that you can do if you're having a hard time finding your extended replacement coverage is right to your Write to your adjustment, ask them to show, show you where it is. Okay. Um, okay, so other structures, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, these are your barns. And in the policy, that, um, when they outline you know, coverage A, coverage B, they'll tell you what they are. Because some policies, the other structures, it says we cover, you know, other buildings on the location separated from the main dwelling by clear space or something like that. And usually fences will fall into that. And sometimes, you know, gazebos, garages, and stuff. So read your specific policy to find out where those go. Because sometimes there's a little bit of crossover between should it go into other structures or is it part of landscaping? Because some landscaping covers some patios and different parts of and things like that. So you want to make sure you're ready to do the maximum now. Okay, cover C personal property. That's pretty um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you'll find that you'll remember things. Keep a little notebook with you and as things pop into your head, write them down because um, you'll find that you do things that you remember, that you just reach for and your book is not there. Okay, additional living expense. So this is a very timely thing right now. Um, there are two different ways that insurers cover what's called loss of use, okay? And you're going to okay, sorry, I'm going to stand for the um, There's two different ways. One is additional living expenses, okay? And that's the increased cost, really important, to maintain your standard of living. Okay, so that is a, the, the common one. Well, they're going to say, um, we're going to pay your rent, we're going to pay rent for furniture, and there's a whole list. And if you go to our website, there's a citation now, there'll be a whole list of things that can count as additional living expenses. Mileage, if you're like now, a lot of you guys are living 30, 40, 50 miles from where you used to live, and the commute is longer, and so mileage counts in there. Um, if you um, say you had a fenced yard for your pet and this place doesn't have a fenced yard, you need to put a fence in, that's going to be an additional living expense. There's a board of your pets. If your pets need to stay temporarily somewhere and you can get located, that's really important. Some policies have the option um, between collecting additional living expenses and what's called fair rental value. Okay, so look in your policy and find out um, what you have because fair rental value in a lot of cases, um, if you have the choice, it might be a better choice for you um, because fair rental value says that the insurance company is not going to pay your increased expenses. What they're going to pay is what the fair market 
rental value of your home was before you lost it. Okay, so if it would cost you know two thousand dollars a month to rent your house, they would give you that two thousand dollars a month, which in a lot of cases we've seen people in Sonoma be very creative with it. So one of the issues, um, and we tell you to take your time to do all this. The big number one issue against taking your time is ALE. A lot of um, the ALE is extended thanks to uh, some legislation. So you guys have longer than people who were in the situation last year. Um, but it's going to take a long time for the infrastructure of your community to be rebuilt and to get into contractors and to, get, to do all this is going to take an incredible amount of time. And meanwhile, your additional living expenses are taking off. So some of the people who have fair rental value, like in Sonoma, negotiated with their insurer and said, um, hey, you know, my house would have been, you know, two or three thousand dollars a month. Give me that. And then they took that money and they either made a down payment on a, a smaller place or they um, they bought a, a fifth wheel and moved it onto their property. They, they bought some tiny houses. There's just a lot of creative things that you can do with that. Um, so it won't hurt to ask, even if you don't have the fair rental value coverage as part of your policy, it will not hurt to ask. Are you willing to do this instead of me paying rent and sending you the send you this stuff every month? So um, it's important. They don't cover your mortgage payments. You still have to make your mortgage payment, which is like insult to injury when you have no house and you have to make a mortgage payment. Um, but they'll pay you know anything over and above what you normally pay. So really go through. I really encourage you to go and look at our page on that. Um, because there's a lot of information in there that, that will explain that. The one thing I'm going to say about ALE and partial loss um, people, it's really important. Um, go into your policy and find what we call the insuring agreement. And most of them say that um, when a loss insured, a fire is insured, causes the resident's premises, that's your house, to become uninhabitable, not fit to live in, we owe you the increased cost to maintain your standard of living. Okay, so on the partial loss, I've heard from people, I was at the forum a couple of Fridays ago, I've heard from people who, their adjuster said, well, as soon as the roads open, we expect you to move back into your house. Okay, that's absurd, okay? So don't, <laughs> you need to push back on that. Um, some of the people were saying they didn't have a, have you guys, have you guys heard of this? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you don't have water or electricity or sewer, and they want you to move back. Your house is uninhabitable, okay? <laughs> By a loss insured. So you need to really, really stick to that. And the other thing that we saw, and it's really hard because there's a shortage of housing, it's, it, everybody's scrambling to find a place. Don't worry too much about finding a long-term place, like find your emergency place, and then when things loosen up a little bit, find a more comfortable place. Because we found a lot of people living in tiny, tiny apartments who come from big houses. And, and, that, I don't know, and that might be the only option you have right at this minute, but it's not your only option for 36 months, okay? So it's to maintain your standard of living now watch if you have a if you have a coverage limit, then you want to watch, you know, that you're gonna be able to stretch that for the amount of time you need. But if you're one of these people that doesn't have a monetary coverage limit, then you know, you know, you need to be comfortable. So if you have you need to live in a place that is comparable to what you had before as best you can find it. I know mean, it's hard to find, it's easier said than done. Uh, but those are those are the things, and on those partial losses, uninhabitable um, electricity and water and sewer are just the basics. Heat, I don't know, it's important. So don't. Um, so this is on your declarations page is where you'll see whether or not you have a monetary limit for loss of use. Most people will, um, but not all. And then our slide needs to be updated because the new California law right here is 24 months, but the new legislation is 36. Um, so this is just a slide on this. Um, 
Like I said, I have heard in Sonoma, I've talked to people who have the ALE and not the fair rental value, you can just rent to their adjuster and negotiate it. If you negotiate it, follow it up in writing. Because what happens sometimes is, you know, you make a deal with an adjuster and the adjuster's like, great, I'm gonna pay, I'm just gonna pay you five thousand dollars a month, you do what you want. And then the next adjuster comes along and says, Well, I don't know what he was talking about. So make sure whatever happens is a phone conversation, go back and say, This is our telephone conversation where you agreed that this is how we were gonna do it, and then you have it in writing and keep it. And one of the things that we want to mention is sometimes it's a really good idea to set up a separate new email account, like one of the free Gmail or Yahoo, just for your insurance-related correspondence. So that way you catch everything that comes in, everything's in one email, you can leave all the emails there, and sort of, we, we found that people really like that. Okay, so those are the, some of the other things. Um, we talked about debris removal. Landscape is another one that's hidden in your um, policy. It's generally um, it's generally five percent. I don't know why it says ten, but it's generally let's see, generally five percent of your coverage limit. It's under that additional coverages area. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who say, well, I had you know fifty acres of trees now gone. Um, you know, they only pay me X amount. Uh, the fact of the landscape matter is that you're going to have a limit, and it's probably not going to be enough um, to do what you need to do with your landscape. Um, just make them show you what your limit is and how what it covers. Um, so code upgrades. Code upgrades are really important. Another one might be on your policy, might not. Some people might have code upgrade coverage, some people might not. And it might be on your declarations page, it might be hidden in your policy. Hopefully, your um, adjuster will tell you um, what your limit is, and you can look in your policy and find out. We recommend, when you're doing your estimates, get a separate estimate for code upgrades. And the county and city will be involved in this, and so a fantastic job with really posting all the code upgrades that are going to be required to rebuild houses. Um, I expect as things move along, there'll be more information through your local government on, you know, what here's the new building codes. You know, if your house was built in the 1960s, say, there's going to be a lot of things, windows, um, a lot of insulating factors, um, sprinklers, different things like that. So it's helpful to have the code upgrades separate it out um, the best they can do so it just keeps things a little bit cleaner and easier. Okay, we're gonna um, do a quick hit here. I know we're throwing a lot at you. So, um, and as I said, we didn't really expect um, you to get all of it in, in tonight in one workshop. We will be definitely coming back in January, but we wanted to give you an overview, uh, that's why we call it orientation. So again, on um, on the topic of uh, the adequacy of your coverage, um, we call that under insurance. Again, I told you earlier that um, when we do our surveys, which hopefully we're going to be doing one here down the road to help um, gauge progress and problems, um, it, it is consistently filled with the same number, about two-thirds of people who lose everything in a wildfire, find themselves without enough coverage to put back the house they had. Um, lots of reasons for it. Um, if you find yourself in that situation, I guarantee we'll be doing another workshop just talking about your insurance and strategies. Um, but for now, um, we would encourage you, if you find yourself in that situation, to go to our website and do a little bit of reading. It really does come down to how your limits were set. Um, who, who said what to do and what kind of proof you have. Um, what if my insurer offers less than I think I've owed? Um, our recommendation is you get and you present to your insurer detailed written estimates from reputable independent builders. Um, certainly, if you're working with a public adjuster, that's one of the things that they do um, uh, very well. A good public adjuster will pull all that kind of documentation together for you um, uh, to get you your, your settlement. If you do it yourself, 
again, it just um, it takes it takes some work. Um, consider hiring your own expert. We talked about that to create a scope of loss um, um, to show what the old house what it, what is taken to put that back. Um, setting up face-to-face -face meetings um, with with a uh, contractor that you trust and your adjuster to resolve their differences of opinion over how much it should cost to switch your house plan is a very practical, free uh, way to try to um, break a uh, disagreement over how much you are owed. Um, stay connected to other fire survivors. Um, they're a great source of information about insurance rebuilding financial strategies and an important source of emotional support um, as you go through this process. Spams are very common after disasters. It blows our minds, those of us who are in the helping profession, that anyone would come into an area where people have been hurt and, um, and then try to, to take advantage of them, but it does happen. So we very much encourage you, um, before you hire, any repair or reconstruction professional of any kind, check your references. Very, very important. Check your license status and your references. Um, it's amazing how good salespeople can be, um, you know, when it can seem so nice, um, but it, it is so common that people will come into a disaster area and say, ah, oh, you know, they seem like they, they're going to solve all your problems and you know, build a beautiful house. If it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Um, but again, there's nothing like checking customer references. Um, and, that, uh, and be very careful about paying large upfront fees um, before it has been done. We, we do have uh, lots of information on questions to ask a contractor. So um, again, we are going to do, we'll be doing a workshop in the new year just for partial losses. Um, that would be standing bones. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you here have a standing bone? Okay, so we want to make sure that we include some information in tonight's program. It's going to be quick, um, but I promise you, we will be bringing you more. Okay, so as you guys already know, there's a lot of unique things to deal with on these partial losses. The big things that we overdo, how to deal with your adjuster, how to deal with all your coverages, same. You have a few differences in um, your how you approach the claim. One of the big issues um, that I've been talking to people about is smoke damage, um, testing, whether it's safe to go in your house, um, and things like that. So one of the things that I think is really important is, is that you need to feel safe and secure going back into your home. You need to feel confident that it's safe to go in, that everything's been cleaned and remediated, and that you're back to where you were. So make sure you take your time and really insist on that from the adjuster. So in most cases, if you have some, one of the things that, that I've heard from people is the adjusters walked in and they said, it's wrong. This looks fine to me. I don't smell anything. You know, everything is great. You can just move right back in. Um, if if you agree and you think your house is fine, then great. If you don't agree, you need to talk to them about making sure that your that any smoke you have is cleaned up and that it's safe to go back in. So. One of the things that's really, um, I don't know, it's one of, kind of one of my things is this idea of conflicts of interest with testers. So there's people out there, and they're great. I used to own a restoration company myself. Restoration contractors can do a lot of good work. There's a lot of um, companies, big companies that will come in, and they'll do smoke remediation, and they'll do a good job. Be wary of people who do the testing and cleaning. Okay, so one of the things that I always advocate is have an independent company test your house. Um, I think that the insurance adjusters should be required if there's reasonable um, evidence that you have smoke in your house, that they should send out a certified industrial hygienist. So write those words down, certified industrial hygienist. Because those people really are the only people that are really qualified to do air quality, indoor air quality testing, surface testing, um, and, and things like that. 
I talked to people and they said, well, the adjuster walked in and he ran his finger, you know, up the wall and said, oh, it's fine. Um, and they're like, oh, he did a vertical surface instead of a horizontal surface. Well, most of the smoke settles on horizontal surfaces. Um, if your adjuster is saying that the house is fine, if you have a reasonable belief that it is not, that you have smoke damage, ask them to show you their qualifications um, and give you a certification that your indoor air quality is safe. They can't do it. They're not qualified to do it. You're not qualified to do it. The only people that are qualified to do it are actual reputable people. Um, they should come in. They should do testing in various areas throughout the house, places where smoke tends to settle. If you have attic vents and an attic is insulated, they should test in the attic. Um, if you have um, a raised foundation and there's foundation vents and insulation under there, they should test under there. The common places where the smoke comes through. And it really is using reasonable how close was the fire to your house, or which direction was the wind blowing, you know, how um, I talked to people who, whose windows blew out because the heat was so strong, and that was the adjuster, and it's like, yeah, your house is fine, and it's not fine. Um, so you really need to stick up for yourself, insist on it, um, if you have to, hire your own. If you don't trust, I hate to say that, but if it's what gives you your peace of mind, um, then do it, and then try to get them later to reimburse you for it, but get reports. And then once you get a report, they should do a pro. It's called a protocol for the cleanup, and it's very you know common in the industry. And they should. It's basically a very specifically outlined list of things that they're going to do to remove the smoke and change the air quality. And um, so I think that's all really important. And I think that um, you need to really push it with your adjuster because they're trying. It seems like they're really pushing to try to get people back in the house before they're really comfortable. So, um, and then things like cleaning and replacing soft goods obviously take in smoke. Um, there are really good companies that do textile cleaning. Um, it's, it's been shown that if you go to some of these, it's not a regular dry cleaning, but a regular um, textile restoration companies, they actually remove the smoke. They can get every right, there's a company out there that can get asbestos out of fibers. So they're really good at it. Those things can be cleaned and things like mattresses can't. There's nothing they can really do with like a mattress. Soft goods are going to pull the smoke in more than hard goods. Things like sealed floors can be cleaned. So you don't have to worry too much about things that are really hard and non-porous can be cleaned in most cases. It's the porous things that take things up. So those are the things you're going to want to talk to them about replacing. Pillows. Um, pillows and mattresses and things like that. Okay, so um, it's just not good reports. Um, and these are just some hot spots, and you know, sometimes it's, it's tough. These adjusters are overloaded, it's not a good excuse, so just um, keep going. And industrial hygienists, I'll just tell you, are really expensive. I haven't, I was telling you recently, I still don't have a good name yet. Um, I, I would hopefully the city and county will get some information on that for you guys. It's tough. There's you know not a lot of hygienists hanging around you know paradise area all the time. So um, there likely to be people that come from you know the city or other metropolitan areas. Um, these are common disputes, no damage. Um, line of sight, so they talk about you know they owe you you have to take out carpet. There's there's a lot of um, and, and they're in the Fair Plans Practices regulations saying that you know, if they have to take out part of something, they owe you within the line of sight to make it reasonably match. So if you have you know, your dining room, your living room, or attached, and you need to have the carpet thing and it's open, they owe you for both rooms. So that's, those are some of the things that like out-of-state adjusters, like a lot of states don't have matching rules, like kind of quality rules, so you need to sort of stay on top of them for that. Um, there is a, there, and you can just Google it online, there's a Fair Claims uh, Settlement Practices Act, and there's a whole section on um, Fair Claims handling you know, that you can read. It's pretty easy to read. Um, hidden damage, this is air dust. If your heater was on at the time the smoke came through, you need to have your ducts tested um, and cleaned probably. Um, 
you know, I don't know, there's this huge between behind drywall. I personally don't think unless there's an opening, I don't think the smoke can usually get behind drywall unless it's actually scorched. Um, but uh, insulation does grab smoke. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've seen a lot of some of these uh, partial losses in Sonoma have been harder to settle down um, than the total losses because it's just sometimes the difference between what the insurance company considers damage and what the homeowner considers damage is different. So you really need to try to rely on really objective third party um, opinions on that. And they should be paying it. Um, thorough inspection, again, it's the same idea as with um, any contractor to me. Make sure that they're qualified to do what they're doing. Make sure that their licenses are in place, that they do a thorough inspection. Somebody is there and they can explain it to you that they just don't send a bunch of mumbo jumbo um, and then that'll help. Okay. Uh, I think there should well there should somebody should pay for an inspection. Um, sometimes they walk at it. You should keep pushing. Um, and, and you should if you feel like the inspector they sent isn't qualified, um, you need to kind of keep track of why. Okay, and then write to them. And like say if they send somebody who's not a certified industrial hygienist, somebody who just you know does some sideline work, you just write to them and, and do that. And you can write up a lot if you need to. We're almost done. We're almost ready for the QA. Okay. So um uh, how many of you have ever heard of a public adjuster before the campaign? Okay, not a um, so a public adjuster is um, is a profession that's been around a very long time, uh, but you won't encounter them unless you had a very serious loss, uh, because they do uh, typically work on a commission basis. Um, that is the um, a percentage of what they of what they collect for you. So um, we work very we have worked over the years with some public adjusters um, that have been. Phenomenal uh, because they're experts. They really know um, what's in an insurance policy and how to effectively negotiate with adjuster. And then we've also encountered a lot um, that are just not that have disappointed their clients. So it's just like any other profession, there are great ones and then there are lousy ones. And the only way uh, to really decide which one you want to hire, if you decide that you do not have the time um, or the energy. To deal with this yourself is to try is to get the references and check references. I mean, of all the professions, one of the most important uh, things you can do before you hire a PA is check the references. Um, what is the pro of hiring a PA? A diligent PA can take the weight off your shoulders by fully documenting your claim and negotiating a higher settlement than you might get on your own. What's the con? Uh, the cons of hiring one is that an overloaded or an unethical PA can further delay your claim, make matters worse, um, and or diminish yourself. Because as I said, if you take a cut of what they get from you, most people who hire a good one feel like it was worth it because the person got the more they would have on their own, so they, 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 they came out the same. Um, if you do decide to hire one, be sure to only hire a licensed one, um, ask for their license number and check it. Ask for references and check them. Ask them if they're a member of CAPIA, the California Association of Public Insurance Investors, or NAPIA, the National Association of Public Insurance Investors. Um, some strategies for proving your losses photographs, pre post family, we talked about that, public records. Again, the county is going to be helping you guys out as much as they can um, with, with reconstructing lost documents. Um, but again, it's going to take some time, so please. I'm sure a lot of them are working over time. Um, as, as complicated as it may be in this community, I know it is. Um, documents, um, our library, networking with neighbors. In summary, a paper trail is very important. Learn to earn, know your policy limits, etc. Um, repeat that phrase often. Can you show me where it says that in the policy? Right? Ask your adjuster that um, whenever you need to. Only you know what the condition was of your property and your insurance. 
okay? Um, use our sample letters uh, and our tips. Again, help from the California Department of Insurance and or claim help pros such as public adjuster. Um, typically, a lawyer is not going to be somebody you're going to need to help you with your insurance claim, but we know that a lot of lawyers are, are um, making themselves available for you to hire them to uh, file a lawsuit against PGE and they're saying, well, also adjust your insurance claim. If that is something that you're counting on, um, that's a, a situation where you really, you know, typically you're going to hire your lawyer for their lawyering skills. Not for their claim adjusting skills. So, if they have brought somebody onto their team, as some of these law firms have, I would highly recommend before you hire that lawyer that you meet the person that they would be assigning you to work with on their uh, on your on your claim. Because again, just like hiring a public adjuster, um, it's going to be a long term relationship. You're going to be working with this person. And you want to love them. You want to feel comfortable with them. Um, so the CDI, um, the California Department of Insurance, um, their help is free. They cannot be a free lawyer for you or for the claim adjuster, um, but they will answer your questions. They can help you get extensions if you feel like you're needing more time and the insurance company is jamming you. The CDI can help. They have a toll free hotline. I've got it up there 1 800 927 HELP, H E L P. Um, I'm also giving you their. Um, their web address. They have a process, um, an RFA, a request for assistance, and you can file one of those. It's free. If you have a problem, you can fill out one of their forms. You can fill it out online. You can fill it out on the phone. They will assign uh, an officer to you to work with you, um, and they can help you. But again, you have to keep your expectations clear. They're not going to be your lawyer. And they're not going to adjust your claim, but they will definitely help make sure that the insurance company and its representatives are following the law and are treating you their That is their part of their job. Um, and they also they regulate insurers, they regulate adjusters. If you have a problem with a with an adjuster, a public adjuster, a company adjuster, um, you can get you can seek help from the Department of Insurance. Uh, so for more information, we, we've told you um, our web address, uphealth.org. Um, we are, as I said before, we're a uh, 503, we're a smallish nonprofit. Um, we do not have the manpower, people power, um, to answer every single question. We really um, encourage you not to try to use, um, uh, try to call us. It's very hard for us to answer um, phone calls because we, we feel a lot of empathy. For all of you, and we would love to spend a lot of time with you. But the best thing is either come to our workshops, use our website, or email us. And we will do our best uh, to be with you on your road to recovery and as support you. So we're going to open up the floor now to questions. So Treya is going to help us um, with. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So, come on. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Try to keep it as short as you can. And remember um, that we're all here. It's, it's, a, it's a long night. Um, and just try to keep it as brief as you can. So, so I have asked several times for my complete policy to my adjusters and my agent. Still haven't received it. And the adjusters say they have not received it. State Farm. I looked at your letter and you said to send it to somebody at State Farm. And here you also said on the extent policy to, to ask for the highest level. How do you find out who we should send that to at State Farm? Well, it's just by sending it to your insurance adjuster or any representative of the company qualifies as you formally requesting it and it triggers the requirement to get it to. So, you can ask your adjuster who should I send it to. You can send it to you ask to make the request of your insurance agent, if it's a state farm agent, for example, or, or a company representative. It, it shouldn't matter. And if you're running into a roadblock and you're, and you're still not getting it, then contact us and we can contact our contacts with the insurance company to make sure they get you your policy and correct policy. 
I'm curious to know what would need to be in place before you would recommend uh, canceling house insurance or downgrading it to a, a big lot policy. Well, a couple of things. One of the benefits of uh, one of the protections in place is that the insurance company is required to renew you on your next renewal. So, for people that uh, want to keep their insurance, they're required to renew you on your next renewal. And in doing so, we're going to have a conversation with you and your representative of the agent to discuss what your current situation is. So, if you're clear the lot, you might still receive liability coverage or course construction coverage or other types of coverage. Uh, so you still want to keep your policy in most cases. And so they're required to renew you for that one renewal. And that could adjust your premium. So, so if you no longer have a home and it's a clear lot, maybe that adjusts your premium down. But you also might have some additional risks, of course, construction liability, that those sorts of things. So the decision you have to make, but you're welcome to cancel your policy, it's not going to affect your claim. Your claim is still valid regardless of whether your policy is canceled today or it continues forward. Um, and I want to add in addition to what Tony just said, um, that this is a very common question. Why should I pay to ensure something doesn't exist anymore? Um, and there is a requirement in the law that the, that the insurance company is supposed to work with you to adjust the limits. In general speaking, um, we don't recommend that you just drop the coverage completely because for a couple of reasons, um, we have the, the insurers are going to probably be a little skittish about writing houses in this area for a while. So since you have that coverage in place, we would recommend that you, you can reduce the limits and get it down as cheaply as you can, um, but really give, um, give it a lot of thought before you are, like, um, get canceled. Um, and, Yes, again, you know, you're going to have, you want to have some liability protection on the lot, you know, while it's vacant in case somebody were to get injured. And then once you start building, of course, you want coverage, and then you also want coverage if you start replacing your stuff in a temporary house. I mean, the last thing I want people to do is waste money, you know, paying premiums on something that doesn't exist. It's just, it's not as simple as you can say, like, well, I'm just going to cancel it. It's just a decision you want to make thoughtful. Next one. I have a question for ALE. Um, is it mandatory that they give an advance or is that optional? It's not mandatory, but virtually every company has agreed to the first request that the insurance commissioner made, which was just four months of additional living expense coverage. Okay, in my case, it's not, it's not something you want to do. The other thing is the 36 month. Um, extension in California. That's really the law because they told me it's not. They told me it was 24 months. So is it really 36 and they lied to me? Or is it 24 months and it's an option? Yeah, it's 30, the law is 36 months. The law went into effect in September prior to this virus. So for any prior after September 21st, the, the law is 36 months for additional living expense coverage uh, or residential property residential insurance policies. So they have the same kind of policy you have to make sure it's totally in that category, it's 36 months. Now it doesn't increase your limit. So if you have a $100,000 limit, it doesn't increase that $100,000, but it does increase the time you have to collect. Okay, so, and, and just before we move on, that is the exact kind of situation where you want to send them a confirming letter saying, even though Everybody else seems to be getting a four month advance on their on their uh, temporary rent. Your company is refusing to give that to me. You can send that letter. Um, believe it or not, I actually can start to build some leverage for them to treat it better. They see that way. My question is pretty quick. For those of us that are going to be out of town, staying someplace else, the future meetings will be broadcast on your Facebook page. And is that just United Policy Hope? Yes. Yes. Let's see. We actually can answer a question in one word every once in a while. Who is the proper authority to determine if the quality of the air in the entire community and, and the surrounding possible surrounding 
contaminants in the earth and free market and so forth, who would determine if that whole community is safe enough to go and inhabit? That's a, it's a tough one because, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be the county, it's going to be the municipalities. Um, your, your individual insurer is only going to cover your house and your indoor air quality and your own house. So when you say community, you have to think about what public space is for any restriction. No, the insurance company, the insurance company is not going to do anything in terms of the general overall area. You're only going to be concerned with your home and your house and the air quality inside your house. So, um, you know, so you want to have that. Well, I would say it's a question that we don't have any interest in saying here right now, but we can kind of get that for you. I'd like to think that. So, I'll just a quick follow up. County or the, or the state of the analysis. Just a quick follow up. I called the uh, county health department, and they told me that they weren't the authority to do that. that. That it would have to be somebody. Okay, so I think that there is, of course, a concern about um, everyone's health and safety. In the aftermath of the situation. Um, and you're, what we can tell you is uh, it's not the insurance company's responsibility to determine whether the air outside of your home is safe. Um, and it really, um, I think, you know, something your local representative is about um, back there. Um, yeah, my question is regarding the family. My insurance company has said that I have to give them receipts before they can give me any of my adjusted living expenses or any more um, Okay, so I lost the night and that's total loss. Right. So so again, this is one of those situations where the the policy, like many of the policies do say that they won't cover ALE expenses until they have been incurred and then you give them proof that you've actually incurred that expense. But again, in the aftermath of disasters, there is this agreement that the insurers, most of them have said they were going to abide by it, they would give you that four months in advance without requiring receipts. Um, so you may be in a situation to what is that his um, your insurance company is just digging their heels in and saying, we're going to get us receipts. Yeah, but was kind of, we're, we're not aware of any company that has refused as advisors that they will not be offering this. So um, if, if you if you involved in the company that is not offering that form, let's contact us uh, through our website or our hotline and let us know who the company is, let us give us your information, and we'll get to that company and see what their situation is. Okay, one second question to that also, Lisa. Um, because they're telling me they can't give me my original policy, they're sending me a pocket policy. Um, but they wait, they said that because my policy is over 20 years age, that they can't send me my original policy. They need to send you a copy of the policy that was enforced on the date of loss. So you don't need your original policy. So the policy form to change every 20 years. So you need the, your policy period is from the effective date of the policy to the expiration date of the policy. So where that, where your fire falls within those dates, you need that specific policy. So you need the one that was enforced on the date of loss. I also want to add something about ALE. Even if they do advance you the four months, keep your receipts. Because in policies that say that you have to incur it, they're going to come back and say, okay, account for that four months as they pay you forward. So even if they pay you four months in advance, you still have to sort of account for what you spent because they're going to they're going to true that way. So it's important to have all those receipts, all your food, all your rent, all your receipts. So I have another ALE question. Um, if we pay off our mortgage, um, uh, or are they going to say, well, we don't need to pay the rent anymore because it's not additional living expenses? No, no. It's still additional living expenses. Not, and they would owe you your rent even if you didn't have a mortgage in the house. So yes. that's, that's fine. It doesn't matter. So an increased cost to maintain your standard of living. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, is anybody here with the a American Reliable Insurance Company? I'm sorry, American, mm -hmm. say it again. American Reliable? Yes, okay. American Reliable Insurance Company. I had this uh, policy for five years, 
and based on non-visual notice to man. And at that time, there was many facts was going on. I didn't get it. So I just find out they only <coughs> my policy and my house gun and no insurance. I didn't know what to do. And that's, I'm sure, very, very scary. Um, I would strongly recommend, um, first of all, you can, you can certainly call it the Lake Department of Insurance. So I would have just such a complaint, a request for assistance, but I also would confer with a, with a lawyer who works in this field because it could be that it's not your fault that you didn't get the last notice, and that's the kind of thing where you need an advocate to help you um, piece together the history, and it's pretty tough to do it on your own. Um, so we can sort of chat after I can get this one suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. The Department of Insurance can also look at this uh, pretty quickly. We can go through your policy from the beginning, the first time you signed up, and through this period. And make sure the insurance company follow the law in reference to proper disclosure notification when they not renew. And so we would ask them uh, for that information. And that would be a good first step. And then, for some reason, if we're not able to resolve that issue, then the step that Amy mentioned is the next step. Yeah, um, when the, the, like the second or third day after the disaster, um, Insurance companies told me basically you have to choose ALE or you have to choose the next option. And I was wondering if that kind of pressure was normal or if there's a reversible option so that I could change if I want to, if I determine that it would be better to pass you the ALE. So, so let me just make sure that I have that right. You're saying that they said to you on day after you just found out that your house was gone, that you had to make a choice between getting um, the fair rental value um, or your temporary rent? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay, that does not sound right to me, that does not sound reasonable, that does not sound fair, um, and I would definitely recommend um, okay. you make that decision to change it down the road. Um, we did find in Sonoma County a lot of people switched. If they had that option in their policy, they simply went to the adjuster and said, Look, I'm going to run out of money um, before the end of my 24 months. If I do it the way I'm doing it, then we switch to fair rental value and then I can use it and, and use that money a little bit more carefully. There's so I've seen little, people switch. There's also very little control over how I have to, like, it put me in a place where basically cheat up over five thousand dollars of the ALE money in less than one month. Yeah, and I would just also add that you, you should put the request in writing and then if they refuse that reject that request to come back. Thank you. The question is for Tony is the California law eighteen hundred the governor Brown signing left in September in fact where we get a we have two hundred percent coverage on our growing we can move out of state and still use that two hundred percent. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That that was one of the laws that passed this year uh, and that law passed on an emergency basis which made it effective in September. Uh, it does apply. Um, the provision that you mentioned is an older law that was amended and refined this year, but uh, the way it works is you have a right to your full replacement costs that includes your replacement cost coverage, any extended coverages, any of the enhancements to coverage, uh, the durable code upgrade. Right? You, you do the math, as was discussed today, of what you have and what the costs are revealed on the current line. And that's the amount you have of policy limits to use on rebuilding in a new location or purchasing an already uh, built home in another location. So the, the state doesn't matter. Um, where you move, there may be some tax benefits as to moving in certain areas or certain counties where you can move your, your tax basis over. So that's something to think about. So, so that law is in effect. So, uh, 1800. So, the 2050 insurance, there's a the California insurance code that has most of the provisions we have been talking about tonight. 
um, is it's online, it's free, and it's the right to take your the benefits that you would get if you rebuild at your old location and instead use those benefits to buy a new home or place your home elsewhere is in section 2051.5 of the California Insurance Code. We have a lot of materials on our website about it. You put in the search box to rebuild a body. You don't want to go into great, great detail about it, but just to know that that is one of those prime examples of a, of a law, a right, that you have in California that you don't have in other states. And therefore, a lot of your adjusters are clueless about it. That doesn't mean they're right. They're supposed to be trained in our laws. But it, just the reality is some of them just don't know about it. And there was a lot of arguing over the last couple of years over whether you could um, whether you could take both the rebuilding costs, including your code upgrades and your extended coverage if you have that, and use that towards buying. And we were saying the whole time, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can. And then the legislature came and said, yes, you can. So basically, um, that what I want you all to take away from this is um, that you do have the right if you have replacement value home insurance. You have the right to use that money to buy a replacement home instead of going through um, the rebuilding process. Many people feel that they're going to do better by rebuilding. That is your choice, and that is not a decision you need to make now. That is um, for sure. Okay, where's our. Hi, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, we have a lot of trees on our property, like a lot of people in paradise do. Um, is it legitimate to negotiate to use the debris and tree buckets for that cleanup outside of the foundation area and then let Cal OES or whoever's doing the debris cleanup come in and do their cleanup? And uh, so we can use essentially all of our cookery and tree cleanup money to the fullest extent. And uh, LOES will cover the cleanup within the hash all the time. Well, well, first, you need to look at the policy and make, sh and make sure that we don't know if you're an insurance company who would agree to that, right? You need to first approach them with that. And I'm not sure if they would agree to do that. If, if they did do that, you, you should work with first understand the consolidated delivery of the program to make sure that you're not potentially jeopardizing uh, what they call duplication of benefits in the FEMA world uh, so that you're going to be able to avail yourself of, of the consolidated delivery program which is a good program that's financially benefit, beneficial to you. But if you use up the dedicated delivery of coverage, then I'm not sure how that would work with the consolidated program. So you want to make sure that it's different by county. Some counties will allow you to do some degree renewable and you'll be able to then use what's left of that degree renewable to pay off the, the county when they do the invoicing. But it's really up to the county as to how they're going to approach it. Whoever the final invoice is to give to the or the city. So we have uh, time for two more questions um, before we're going to wrap up. Um, we want to make sure we talk out of as close to eight as possible. Okay. 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 Real quick, I'll give you a two part question. Just real quick, though. You touched on it earlier, 8% on the personal property. Now, if a certain company is okay with that, I can petition 80%, but then I can go back and itemize later and try to get the other 20%. You, so the problem is, once you take the 80%, um, if you if you want the the twenty, you're gonna have to go back to dollar one and itemize all the money. You're not gonna be able to just start itemizing the property. I got you. Okay. okay. The other question is, if I am my insurance company is now controlled by Sigma, what's the difference between the two? Well, I mean, I mean, it's the same thing. 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 It's the are now having to go through something called the CICA, the, the California Insurance Guarantee Association. It's a claim process. Um, we have a, a, some information on our website about it, so does CBI. My understanding is 
Um, there is a max of 500,000 um, uh, uh, per, well, because here you go, you don't need your car. Well, I would suggest that you go through the process, that the process should be much different with CDX and with your insurance company. It, it, it started out a little slower because it had to get all the green files had to get transferred over to CEDA. But go through the process. If you want to do it, you're a little more contact us and let us walk you through it and get with them to make sure it's good. Just so I understand, the question was, is it for pocket or per claim? Well, it's a destination that still needs to be worked out. We, our, our, our belief and our uh, preference, obviously, is that it's per, per bucket. Right. But, you know, we don't have any uh, formalized anything writing where it's where it distinguishes one way or the other. That's the way we're moving forward on it. So, but again, you said something about the video writing falls in my favor. Yeah, we have, to, we have to look at We can't say whether something is ambiguous or not until we actually get into the specifics. And I think also we're talking about the senior process would be if not an insurance policy. Yes, referring back to the um, smoke damage, I was told that there is a new law now in which you have to have someone come and test the attic and the furniture and all, and that if it has a certain rating, you have to send the furniture out in a container. They will take it out and clean it so that the house is empty for cleaning it. If you don't do this, that you won't be able to sell your home in the future. Well, I do not know about that. That may be a real estate type disclosure type of a of a rule, um, but that's not something that we're really looking for. Um, one, last one last question. Thank you. Okay. I promise we will be back. In fact, uh, my insurance company gave me a check for the facility to be, and I was wondering, no. Will come in there. Now, if I pay off my mortgage, does that mean I lose my upgrade value for replacement? Paying off your mortgage should have nothing to do with your uh, relationship with your insurance company, other than that it takes your mortgage company off of the checks that your insurance company is writing, and it takes them out of the loop as a another pair of eyes on the quality of the construction as it's going.